All right, everyone. So in this video, we are going to be going through the last little bit of naming. Um, we want to talk about how you name when you have a transition metal, and we're going to be going into formula writing. Now, luckily, form writing a formula is really easy once you already know how to name things. So as a refresher, something you're going to need to remember is how to identify the charge. So we have a video going through why this is the case. Um, in more detail in the unit 2 folder and the unit 3 folder, I believe, in both places. But when you're looking at your periodic table, which this is obviously the most beautiful periodic table you've ever seen drawn, um, your charge for most of your elements can be determined by the column that it's in. So anything in column 1 will have a plus 1 charge, column 2 is positive 2, over here at column 13, it's positive 3, and then you have a positive 4 or negative 4 in column 14, and then it goes in to your negative. So negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, and then your noble gases in column 18 are have a charge of 0 because they never bond with anything, they don't react, they have a full octet. Now notice the big section that was skipped is this center section. Um, and this is our transition metals, okay? And so if you are ever trying to write a name where, that has a transition metal, you're gonna have to include something special in your name. So let's dive into it. So our transition metals, which are groups three through 12 on the periodic table, are unique because they can have multiple charges. So we talked about how something like oxygen, since it's in column 16, will always be a negative two charge. That's just how it is. But your transition metals, they don't know how to make up their mind. They're sometimes positive one, sometimes positive three, sometimes positive two. And it's all because of the electrons that are located in that D sublevel. And this means when we write the chemical name, we have to use Roman numerals in order to indicate the charge, okay, because it's different. Now, um, our Roman numerals, to remind ourselves, okay, what they are, so if we we're going to zoom in here, got to remember how to write a Roman numeral. So Roman numeral one is just an I. A capital letter I. So some people write it as just a line or you might see it like this. Uh, Roman numeral two is two lines or again like a double I. And then three, three lines. A four is a line and then a V. And that's because five is V. So when you put the one in front of it, it's saying five minus one, which is four. Now if you put the one in front of the V, that's saying five plus one, which is six. And then you have 7, 8, and then 9 is 1 minus 10, and the symbol for 10 is an X, so 9 is IX, okay? Which is why if you've ever watched Hercules, you know um, that part where Hercules is going to go rescue the kids who are trapped under the rock, and one of the little kids is like, call IXII. -I. It's because they're saying IXII -I, as in 9 one one just a little greek latin humor there for you so they're just saying call 911 but in roman numerals um so that's just a fun fact so when we look at these two examples okay the thing to note is first of all they're ionic right because you have iron iron is a metal oxygen is a non-metal so they're both ionic and also we know that fe is a transition metal Okay, so because it's ionic and they're also binary, right, because we only have two elements, that means when we name it, we just say, okay, Fe is iron, O is oxygen, and since it's the second element, we change the ending to IDE. And that would be the same for both of these. However, we know that they have different formulas. You have Fe2O3 and FeO right? They're different formulas, so they can't have the same name. So what you do is you end up putting your, the charge of iron in parentheses uh, represented by Roman numerals. And the way you figure out the charge is pretty easy because there is a rule that all ionic compounds follow. And that's that the positive and negative charges must always balance, okay? They must always balance. And so what you do 
is you create like a little chart or that's at least what I do to balance, um, to organize my work. And remember that when there's no number here after each element, that means there's a subscript one, just chemists are kind of lazy. So we don't write it. So I have one iron and one oxygen. Now, again, remember the charge of iron is a mystery. It's a transition metal. It's sometimes positive two, sometimes positive three. It can change, but oxygen can't ever change. Oxygen is always negative two. So if our negative side is a total of negative two, what that tells you because of our rule is that these two numbers, the positive side and the negative side, have to balance each other out. The only thing that can balance out a negative two charge is a positive two charge. And if this is positive two, it must be because of iron. And so that tells you that iron has a plus two charge. So you take that two, and you turn it in to a Roman numeral. And so our name for FeO would be iron two oxide because we're talking about the particular iron that has a positive two charge. Now, if we look at our second example, Fe2O3, we see that it's a different formula. So we know that this iron is gonna have a different charge. So we set up our chart again. And this time I see that I have two irons. So I'm gonna write Fe two times. And I see that I have three oxygens, so I'm gonna put oxygen three times. Now, same as before, the charge of iron is a mystery, but oxygen is always negative two. So negative two plus negative two plus negative two gives us a total of negative six. And if our negative side is six, then our positive side to balance it out must also be six. So when you distribute this six between our two irons, that tells you that the iron must have a positive three charge. And so that positive three becomes our Roman numeral three. So that means we're talking about iron three oxide. So what you wanna do is practice here, okay? And so for example, you would set up your charges. So we'll do one more just because this one includes a polyatomic ion. So remember when you have more, um, when it's not binary, um, because we have copper, we have nitrogen, and we have oxygen, those are three different elements. That means there's a polyatomic ion or something on the back of your periodic table. So we see that we have one copper. So I'm just going to write copper one time. But NO3 is in those parentheses. It's a polyatomic ion on the back of your periodic table. And this two tells you that you have two of them. So that means I write NO3 two times. Now, when you look at the back of your periodic table on your polyatomic ion uh, columns, you'll see that NO3 has a negative one charge. So it's not a mystery. And if this side is negative two total, then this side must be positive two. So when we go to name CuNO32, Cu is copper. It has a it's a transition metal, so I'm gonna put a Roman numeral two for its charge, and then NO3 is given the name nitrate. So what I want you to do is pause the video and then press play when you're ready to check your answers. All right, so go ahead and check your answers. Um, notice that all of our binary compounds, which would be FeBr2 and NiCl2, they both end in IDE because that's the rule. And I apologize for making all of your Roman numerals a Roman numeral two. That's not always the case, but when I was making this worksheet, I didn't even forget, I didn't even remember to um, check whether or not I was actually changing what the Roman numeral would be. So that's my bad. But now that we're done with naming and wrapping that up, let's get into writing ionic formulas. Okay, so when we are writing ionic formulas, the thing that we have to remember is that ionic compounds have ionic bonds between a cation, which remember cats have pause, so cations are positive, so they have a positive charge, and an anion, which has a negative charge. So the positive and negative charge attract each other and create that ionic bond. And when these ions 
bond, they must create a neutral compound. Um, and this means that they have a balanced charge or a charge of zero. So we kind of already talked about this when we were figuring out our transition metal charge. And so, for example, if you have the name aluminum nitride and magnesium phosphate, you know that aluminum and magnesium, they're both metals, so these are ionic compounds, okay? We know they're ionic. And when you do that, your first um, name is always the name of your cation, and the second name is always the name of your anion. And so that's the case for both of these. So you're going to have your positively charged thing written first, your negatively charged thing written second. And so what we do is we know that with ionic compounds, there's nothing in the name that tells me how many of them I have. So we know that aluminum is A with a lowercase l, and nitride, because this ends in IDE, that gives us the hint that we're looking for an element that's on the periodic table, which I'm going to abbreviate as PT, that starts with nitra something, and that it changed the name to IDE. And that would be referring to nitrogen, just regular old nitrogen. And so when we look, aluminum is in column 13, so it's going to have a positive 3 charge. Nitrogen is in column 15, and it has a negative 3 charge. And what we notice is that a positive 3 and a negative 3, they already balance each other out. So we don't actually need more than one of either of them. So my chemical formula is just Al with a capital N. Just one aluminum and one nitrogen, which is technically there, but remember, chemists are lazy. We don't write those subscript ones. But not every charge or every element is going to bond with something that already has a matching charge. For example, magnesium phosphate. We know that magnesium is Mg, and since it's in column 2, it'll have a positive 2 charge. Now, phosphate tells you the 8 means that you should look on the back of your periodic table for that polyatomic ion list. And when you do, you'll see that it tells you that phosphate is PO4 with a negative 3 charge. And a positive 2 and a negative 3, those don't balance out. So I can't do anything about the 2 and the 3 in terms of like, I can't just erase positive 2 and turn it into a positive 3. But what I can do is change the number of each that I have. So if I have magnesium with a positive 2 charge again, if I have two of them instead of just one, now I have positive 4. But positive 4 still doesn't balance out negative 3. In fact, now it's bigger. So what if I just add another, a second phosphate ion? Well, now I've got negative 6 and positive 4. And you might see where I'm going with this because if we add another magnesium, now 2 plus 2 plus 2 is positive 6 and negative 3 plus negative 3 is negative 6. And so the fact that these two match each other tells me that I figured out my correct ratio. And I can see that I have mg, and since I wrote it three times, I put a subscript 3. And then my anion is PO4, but I wrote it two times. And if I put a 2 here, it makes it look like I have 42 oxygens. So what we do is we put parentheses around any polyatomic ion that has more than one of them. So if you have to write a subscript, if you write a polyatomic ion more than once, you put parentheses around it. And that's how we get our formula. So as with the last one, you're going to have practice. So go ahead and pause the video, complete your practice, and press play when you're ready to check your answers. Okay, so check your answers and... Um, make sure that you notice that hydroxide was a polyatomic ion located on the back. Um, and carbonate is also a polyatomic ion. And since you have three of them, uh, you need to have your three written outside of your parentheses. Okay. Um, and that ammonium was also a polyatomic ion. And since you have three of them, you'll have parentheses with the three outside for that as well. Um, and now that we've learned how to write formulas for ionic compounds, 
Covalent compounds are actually even easier. So remember, covalent compounds have bonds between only non-metals. Okay, and their names contain prefixes that are located before the element name, which indicate their subscript or the number of atoms of that particular element. Okay, now something that's going to be important for later, not this unit, but the next unit, is when we talk about certain diatomic elements so remember the prefix di means two and atomic is talking about atoms so diatomic elements are elements that always exist with two atoms together they basically always exist in nature as a bonded pair um, so for example in cellular respiration when we talk about having glucose plus oxygen it's never c6h12o6 plus o it's always plus O2. And that's because when oxygen is by itself, it doesn't know how to be by itself. It always has to be bond. It says, okay, if I can't bond to hydrogen or carbon or sodium or any of the other atoms in the universe, I will at least bond to another oxygen. It does not know how to be by itself. And so there are seven of them, um, and they are hydrogen nitrogen, fluorine, oxygen, iodine, chlorine, and bromine. Now, my high school teacher um, would rearrange it, and he would say that there was a mad scientist whose name was Hofbrinkel, and he would spell it like this, and that's how you would remember it. You would just kind of sound it out. But my college professor would say to have no fear of ice cold beer. And honestly, that just kind of stuck with me. Um, uh, not quite appropriate for high school, but y'all know y'all are underage. You shouldn't be drinking that anyway. So let's pretend that it's butter beer from Harry Potter. So as a review of your prefixes, mono is the prefix for one. The prefix for two is die. Tri is the prefix for three. Four is the prefix for tetra. Penta is the prefix for five. Six has a prefix hexa. Now, one way to keep track of that is hexa has an X, and so does the number six. Okay. Hepta is the prefix for seven. Eight is octa. Nana is nine. And ten is deca. So those are your prefixes. And when you are writing um, covalent formulas, all you have to do is literally look for the prefixes. So for the first one, triphosphorus hept oxide. We know that tri means three and hept means seven. Now, the reason why it doesn't say hepta is remember when you have hepta and oxide for oxygen, you have a double vowel and so the A from the prefix gets dropped. But we know that phosphorus is P and oxide is O, so it's just P3O7. And then carbon doesn't have a prefix, so there's just one, and we know carbon is C. And then tetra is the prefix for four, and fluoride is talking about fluorine, so you're just going to have C1F4. And that's it. And again, you can pause your video and work on this practice and then press play when you're ready to check your work. Alright, so check your work. The way You get your symbols from the name and then you're just looking at your prefixes in order to get the subscripts. And that's all. So hopefully this makes sense and you feel better about doing this on your test next week. Good luck!